In 1997, her first novel made her the first Indian woman to win the prestigious Booker Prize. The book went on to sell more than six million copies worldwide. Since then, she's turned her pen to politics. During the Bush years, she was a fierce critic, calling the invasion of Afghanistan an act of terror on the people of the world. In her home country of India, she's campaigned against mega dams, denounced the rise of Hindu nationalism, and been imprisoned by the Supreme Court of that country for corrupting public morality. She recently spent two weeks walking through the jungle with India's Maoist rebels, the movement the government there has launched an all-out military campaign to crush. Her name is Arundhati Roy. She's here in Santa Fe, New Mexico for a rare U.S. appearance, and she's my guest on this special edition of Fault Lines. It's rare for you to come here to the United States. Have a seat over there. Thank you. Arundhati Roy, welcome to Fault Lines. Thank you. At the height of the Bush years, you were writing about the United States foreign policy a tremendous amount. At one point in a speech in New York, I remember that you said that you were uh, speaking as a, as a subject of the empire and uh, like a slave who dares to criticize the king, George Bush at the time. And then for the past few years, you've written almost exclusively about your own country, about India. W why? Uh, well, it has to do with two things. One was, you know, as a writer and not, I, I, don't, I don't see myself primarily as an activist or a journalist. So once you said what you have to say, you don't want to just keep, Shut up for a while. keep saying the same thing, you know. But the other thing was, I think my own understanding, I, I was one of the people who had said things like, you know, the globalization of dissent and the, the, the making of alliances internationally and so on. But uh, in, the, in the last few years in India, I've realized that it's also, or it's more important to, 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 to fight on the ground, you know. And increasingly, I've seen that the people that are fighting on the ground, who are barricading the roads, who are digging trenches, who are l refusing to let the police in, they're the ones that are winning the fight. In, in the period of the globalization movement around the turn of the last century through all of the free trade battles and, and others um, was when you rose to global prominence in your activist mode as a, as a social commentator, not just a novelist. Um, do you think there was a limitation to that, to those global networks that were emerging, a need to return to the local? I think, um, no, I think it was necessary that it happened, but I don't think it was an institution that had to just perpetuate itself for the sake of it. For example, now in the fight in India is on against um, this sort of corporate takeover of land, of water, and so on. And the people that are winning the fight are not people who are necessarily making these huge global alliances, you know? And they have actually stopped the corporates from taking over for many years. I don't know how much longer it'll continue, but actually for five years, six years, they've been held off. And there's a huge amount of frustration in those corporate ranks, you know. I mean, we've signed the agreements, we've paid the money, we're waiting, and nothing's happening, which is why the government is getting more and more militarized. In your, in your most recent book, uh, Field Notes on Democracy, you talk about a change in India at the end of the Cold War and two things starting simultaneously, an overt alliance uh, with the United States and the rise of Hindu nationalism. Are they connected? Have they worked together? How do you see them? Uh, very much so. You know, I, I, I see it as that in 1989, in those bleak mountains of Afghanistan, when um, capitalism won its jihad against Soviet communism, a lot of things changed in the world, and in, in my part of the world, what happened was the Indian government realigned itself to the U.S., and, and today it calls itself a natural ally of the U.S. and Israel. Around that time, uh, you know, it was as though the government opened two locks. One was the lock of the Indian market, and it became a free market, and the other was the lock of this old 17th century mosque called the Babri Masjid, mm. which the Hindu nationalists said have to, has to be demolished because it's the birthplace of the god Ram. And simultaneously, when these two locks were opened, 
It was as though two kinds of totalitarianism were re released into the country. One was this kind of economic totalitarianism uh, bordering on a kind of fascism. And the other was Hindu right-wing totalitarianism bordering on fascism. And it's interesting that both these processes have produced their own quote unquote terrorists or terrorisms. Mm. So you have Islamist terrorism and you have what's called the Maoist terrorist now. And between the two major political parties in India, the BJP and the Congress, they sort of prioritize these terrorisms in different ways. Mm -hmm. But they use both to further militarize the state. And in parliament, what you have is the opposition as well as the ruling party is always right wing, you know? So it's sort of colonized politics in a kind of way. And, and what you see is a situation where you have, I mean, in 2002, you had a genocide against Muslim people in Gujarat, where, where more than 2,000 people were slaughtered on the streets and women were raped and 150,000 were driven from their homes. And today, the chief minister who, who was chief minister at the time, when the police were helping the rioters, he was voted to power several times, and it's his third session in power. And the biggest industrialists in India, Ratan Tata and the Ambani's, have actually publicly endorsed him as a prime ministerial candidate. So you see the connection between the two, you know, and for both people, this kind of hollowing out of democracy and turning it into a, into a military state becomes important. The Home Minister said recently that uh, he, he envisions an India where 85% of the population lives in cities, which means roughly 500 million people being persuaded or forced to move off their land. You've used a number of incendiary words. I, I know that you don't use them casually, but I think that they require explanation and defense. You, you, you talked about the free market explosion in India, the enviable growth rate, the Indian miracle as it's seen in the mainstream uh, media around the world being uh, a kind of totalitarian economic system bordering on fascism. That's a strong enough statement that I need you to defend it because nobody else you know, talks about India yeah. that way. Because India is a market, you know, so and it's a market which has created a kind of middle class, which is a hugely consuming middle class, which buys cars and ACs and TVs and and it's many many people. Because and of it's the many. Of the size I mean, even it. if it's a small percentage, it's a, it's millions of people. But what has happened on the other side is that um, the majority of the population lives in conditions of extreme malnutrition. The food grain intake in some places is lower than uh, sub-Saharan Africa. 180,000 farmers caught in debt have committed suicide. And there's a kind of devastation of the ecology. You have probably the largest internally displaced population in the world, you know, just 30 million di displaced by big dams alone. And, and you trace all of this to the post-Cold War ascent of the, of the market forces e, in India? E, well, post-Cold War, actually this kind of um, centralized development model was also a Soviet model. Mm -hmm. But this structural adjustment and privatization has, has, has just put it on, on steroids, you know, so it's gone through the roof. And a lot of the growth rate is actually driven by things like mining, which is a very artificial way of pushing up a country's growth rate. It, do, it doesn't necessarily affect the development index. So if you look at the UN development index, India's right at the bottom of the pile, you know? So that's what despite I mean. Despite this roaring growth. Yes, despite the roaring growth. Despite the fact that you've got, I don't know, more millionaires now than the US or China, mm -hmm. you also have the largest population of malnutrition children, malnutrition people, people who by any index would count as living in conditions of near famine. Now you've also talked about the, the uh, slaughter of Muslims in, in Gujarat as a genocide. Yes. That again is a very uh, explosive term. It's a very technical term. It's a Why te do you use that word? It's a technical term and if you look at the UN definition of genocide, you will see that it actually uh, you know, is a word that you could, you could use. And if you look at the um, at the rhetoric 
of the Hindu right. If you look at the RSS, which is the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is the sort of cultural guild of the BJP, they openly talk about how much they admire Hitler and how Muslims should be second-class citizens and all of that. At this tumultuous moment in the conversation, we have to take a break. But we'll be back on Fault Lines with more of this conversation with Arundhati Roy in a moment. We're back on Fault Lines in conversation with Indian novelist and nonfiction essayist and political activist Arundhati Roy. We were talking uh, earlier in the show about battles over corporate control of Indian land. Um, you recently published uh, a long essay about your travels with the Maoist insurgency. And in it, you argue that rather than being uh, India's gravest internal security threat, as your prime minister has argued, that the Maoist insurgency is about indigenous people trying to protect their land from corporate takeover. This is not an analysis which is uh, widely reported. You've been on the inside and the outside of this movement, and you've been studying it for years. What, what have you learned? Well, first of all, I, I mean, the first question would be the use of the word Maoist insurgency, you know, because actually what the, the Maoist movement in India has had several avatars, but uh, basically they, 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 the first uprising was in 1967 in, in, in West Bengal in a village called Naxalbari. And Which is why they then, call it the Naxalite. The movement. Naxalite, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then, but always at the center of the Naxalite movement have been tribal people, indigenous people, who have a history of resistance and rebellion that predates Mao by a few centuries. But why were they suddenly, why did they suddenly become an internal security threat? Because in 2005, a few things happened simultaneously. One is, if you look at a map of India, the forests, the tribals, the minerals and the Maoists are all stacked up on top of each other. And in 2005, uh, the government signed MOUs, that's Memorandums of Understanding, worth billions of dollars with uh, mining corporations. Just the bauxite in Orissa is worth $2 trillion. Wow. The iron ore is something like that. Just then, these MOUs were signed the stocks of the mining company soared. Just that year, I mean just two weeks into the signing of two of the biggest of these MOUs, the Salva Judum, which is a, a kind of tribal people's militia, was, uh, was let loose. And it, it went through the forest, burning villages, killing and raping people. And this was a policy of what is called strategic hamleting, I mean, mm -hmm. you know it from this Vietnam. This is from the Vietnam era. That's right. The two big MOUs in this district called Bastar were signed in April and May 2005. And in June, uh, this people's government-sponsored people's militia was let loose on, on something like 640 villages. And it went through these villages, burning, burning them down, killing people, raping women, and forcing people to move into police camps. Some went voluntarily and some didn't. So about 50,000 people moved into the camps and about 300,000 people went off the government radar. Some of them, of course, went away to work in other states. Some are still, many are still hiding in the forests, afraid to come to their villages, impossible to go to the market. You many, know, many of these people are not necessarily part of the Maoist movement. Many are not, but many are. You know. I guess they're but becoming. Is that yeah, what you're suggesting? Yeah, that the, the Salva Jurum didn't work. It backfired, and more and more people became part of the Maoist movement. So now they've, uh, they've announced a full-scale war, which is called Operation Green Hunt, where something like 70,000 paramilitary troops are closing in on the indigenous people of this country. So, so, so having been inside um, and living with the people in this movement that you've been writing about for years from the outside, how do you compare the portrait that were offered in the official story and what you witnessed living among those people? See, w what, what I think has happened, which is, is very terrifying, and I think even scholars who have studied this kind of thing before have said, is that when a population of people is being prepared to be wiped off the map, not as in 
put into concentration cramps and shot or gassed. But this is a population that is not a consumer population. It's what the Germans used to call Übersaligen Essern, I think, which means superfluous eaters. They, they are not required. So it's important to make them, to either to demonize them or to make them completely f faceless so that when you slaughter them or when you lay siege to them and they're already starving and malnutritioned, when they disappear, you don't notice. So that the rest of the population can live with their consciences clear. So that's what's going on, you know, that they are trying to, to dehumanize them in a way, to, to make it impossible, because it's true that the Maoists' rhetoric can be quite ugly. And they do say very openly they want to overthrow the state. And there are, bo there are bodies piling up on both sides. Well, the bodies piling up on one side and the other, you cannot compare, you know, for one. But the second thing is that, because, I mean, I'll t I just want to say two things. One is, I've been in that forest at night. What do you do when 1,000 policemen come and surround a fo forest village? I mean, do you go on a hunger strike? Or, or what do you do? You have to fight back. And then they say, oh, they, they killed the policemen. It's, isn't it terrible? But well, this is the country that gave the world the Gandhian uh, ethos. The Gandhian ethos is a very frightening ethos in the forest because the Gandhian ethos requires it's 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 performance that requires an audience, you know. And in the forest, there's no audience. In a society that doesn't belong to the rest of society, how do hungry people go on a hunger strike? How do people who have no money not pay their taxes or do civil disobedience? No one cares. No one's watching. You know, I think it's really important to understand that the Maoist movement and this tribal uprising is not able to function outside of the forest. You know, and there there are other kinds of resistance that are happening. So it's not the only resistance in India. There's a huge bandwidth of resistance, all of which the government is calling Maoist and killing people whether they are Maoist or not Maoist. You know? Do you see parallels here with the Taliban, where anyone who is resisting a kind of occupation is labeled with one label when there are clearly many movements? It's, it's, I mean, if you look at what's happening in that part of Asia, from Afghanistan to Waziristan to the northwest frontier provinces to the northeastern states of India to this entire so-called Red Corridor, it's all tribal areas. It's a tribal uprising. And of course, in Afghanistan, it takes the form of uh, an ugly radical Islam. And here, it's an extreme left uprising. But the attack is a corporate attack on tribal homelands. And so they are fighting a kind of occupation, even within India. You know, Coming back to the United States and its place in the world, it, it sounds to me like you're saying that the Indian state has appropriated the sort of war on terror uh, worldview within its own borders. I, if that's so, how is that playing out? And how does that, how does that affect the United States' interests and, and movements in the region? Well, in 1989, coming back to the great jihad in Afghanistan, uh, when India sort of realigned itself, it also appropriated the Islamophobia, you know, the, the, the replacing of, of Islamic terrorism with the I communist, mean, threat, the communist yeah. thing. Now yeah. we have both, of course. And India's um, alignment with the corporate market, the free market, the Islamophobia, all of that is now playing out in, in, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Kashmir. India's jockeying very hard to find a foothold, a sort of strategic foothold mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. And um, that is going to you know, end badly because you know, these borders, these, now it's even becoming difficult to use words like America, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, because you have the elites and all these countries that have actually seceded into a country of their own. And then you have the rest. You know, so what does one mean when one says America or India? You know, I don't know what we mean by that because within India you have, 
uh, obviously the Muslim population, which is 150 million people, have been pushed to the bottom of the social and economic ladder in these last few years because of this kind of Islamophobia. And now they're a very, uh, they're hostage in a way to the politics that is playing out in this region. Mm -hmm. And from Afghanistan to Pakistan to Kashmir to India, you know, the, when you have a terrorist strike like you had in Mumbai, it's impossible just to say, oh, it has nothing to do. I mean, not a single one in the Indian media would mention the word Kashmir or Babri Masjid. Even when those terrorists were actually saying so themselves, they were saying this is for Kashmir, this is for Gujarat, this is for, uh, this is for uh, the Babri Masjid, you know? But these places where Hindu nationalism has, yes. has, has beaten down Muslim. Yes, and, and yet the, 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 the Indian media wants to say, oh, it's Pakistan that's doing it to India. But actually, you know, people don't think like that. People, people's minds go across borders and across histories, and uh, their grievances are not visa-based or border-based or immigration-based, you know? So, and especially when these borders are so disputed. So all of it is playing out in very serious ways and will continue to play out. I mean, um, Obama, you know, came here with hope you can believe in or change you can believe in or whatever it was. But over there, what happened? He just expanded the war. It's expanded in Afghanistan, it's expanded in Iraq. And if you're there and you know that they have no idea what they're doing. What are they going to do? Because beyond a point, as you've seen in Iraq and as you've seen in Afghanistan, you can, surely you can bomb and throw all the daisy cutters you like, but at the end of the day, you've got to have boots on the ground to control those countries. Do you really want to? I mean, our governments can't manage themselves. Would the Americans really like to come and try to govern India or Pakistan or, or Afghanistan? It's impossible. We're out of time. But thank you for crossing so many borders with us on fault lines. You're welcome. <laughs>